7.4 double, uh, double angle identities and half angle identities. Uh, this is the second half of the video for 7.4, which we've already gone over the double angle stuff. There were three examples, so we're done with that. We're going to go over the half angle stuff, and then there's also sum to product and product to sum, so product to sum and sum to product, which the book doesn't emphasize uh, very much. They'll show you a bunch of... Uh, of the product to sum identities and then they'll only have one example over those and then same thing for the sum to product they show you four identities and only one example for those four and it's a quick and easy thing and this is kind of a kind of a shame in calculus you use both of these formulas a lot uh, in the second half of the course or the second semester of the course going over integration and there's a bunch of different types of integration techniques trigonometry uh, makes up a big chunk of those integration techniques and sum to product product to sum angle formulas or uh, identity sorry uh, are very commonly used in those sections uh, even mr nelson which is our ep calculus teacher uh, has uh, uh, told me to maybe uh, increase the amount of stuff that we see over this stuff but this particular textbook doesn't treat it as very important in calculus it is very very important so i might come up with some extra stuff some extra videos on how that's used in calculus or something like that uh, maybe, maybe not. That's on the to-do list. Uh, but considering everything that's going on, the uh, social distancing, physical distancing stuff, uh, that might not be on, at the top of my priority list right now. So I'm going to teach as is. So there's very, very little over that stuff. And then we'll go over the half-angle identities. And we're not going to go over that last example like I was saying in the previous video, most likely. So I'm going to concentrate on the half-angle stuff for this particular video. So we did examples one, two, and three, which those are pretty heavy. Those on the on their own are pretty bad. Uh, example three wasn't too, too bad. Uh, we're skipping example four because that's just some extra little exercise writing sine in terms of, or cosine three X in terms of sine. That's an applications problem. And here's the first group of identities I was referring to earlier. Now these I don't necessarily have by memory. There's a way that you can solve these using the double angle identities and the the sum and difference identities, which these come directly from the sum and difference identities. <clears throat> and uh, here's what those formulas amount to. It ends up being one half. And I need two grouping symbol levels. So brackets on the outside, parentheses on the inside, cosine A plus B. Now what I'm doing here is I'm looking at a second screen on a different computer, what these are, because I really don't have these by memory. Uh, these are one of your lower tier, I guess, formulas. Uh, despite what uh, I was just saying about Mr. Nelson, how he considers this stuff really, really important. It does show up a lot in calculus, uh, but there's a large list of these things. Now, you can go on Wikipedia, like I probably told you guys in class. Uh, on Wikipedia, you can search trigonometric identities, and there's a large page uh, with just a bunch of different trigonometric identities. Some of them we don't consider important at all with respect to this class. Some of them are so fundamental to the course that those are the ones that we consider. Uh, but there's just so many of them. And these are some of those uh, that I don't consider as important or uh, readily useful. So cosine, uh, this would be what? Uh, sine A times sine B. So where do you use these? In calculus, you simplify formulas that look like this. So let's say, for example, and there's new symbols. You take the integral, which is an operation in calculus of some function f of x. And then you write dx, which is a uh, differential, but that basically uh, that basically just uh, represents with respect to the x variable value. You can do this for other variables. If you had multiple variables, x, y, and z, then that would be dx only, and that's with respect to x only, not those other variables. So if you had an integration of a formula that looked like this, cosine 2x times cosine 3x, and then you wanted to integrate that over with respect to x, then you would use the first formula. You would replace the one here with the one in here. And it actually makes the integral procedure a lot easier. That's where you use that in calculus. We don't use that at all in pre-calculus. So that's not something you're going to be interested in, at least for now. Uh, but that is something if you're going to go into calculus next year, uh, whether that's here at uh, Memorial or if it's going to be at another university uh, later on because you're graduating, you want to save these notes and you want to make sure you have these uh, available for when you do see that stuff again in calculus. It's not going to show up until the second semester, most likely, because second semester is where you concentrate on integration. First semester, you uh, concentrate on differentiation, which is a 
uh, another uh, operation in calculus that is considered very, very important. So uh, you'd want to still see these notes and have them saved for later. Uh, but even then, you can always just Google it then. By that point, you'll be so much better at math that you won't need to look back at these notes in particular that uh, you can just Google it by then. But either way, uh, this is one half cosine of a minus b. And then this is a minus cosine a plus b. So here I'm just literally looking at another screen where they're already written down. Sine a times cosine b. If you see something like this, this is one half. Sine a plus b plus sine a minus b. Now this is a little weird that the textbook would do this. There's really just three in my mind. These are the ones that are important. This one is the exact same as this one. That doesn't look like it because the first one's a sine, whereas the first one's a cosine and the second, but they're entirely the same. Uh, what you're trying to do is you're trying to look at things that look like this. And here I see two cosines. So immediately, if you look at the first three, there's only one of them with two cosines, and that's this one. If that second cosine or the first cosine was changed to a sine, let's say, well, there's a formula for that too, and that's the second one. Or not the second one, sorry. That's the third one. But if that sine was a cosine, and this cosine was a sine, you would still look at the third one again. Sine A, cosine B. So you just move them around in your mind. Cosine first, and then sine second. Or you could switch it so that way it's sine first, cosine second. So it doesn't really matter. The distinction is, well, what letter are we using, A or B? But it's still a sine and a cosine. One sine, one cosine. It's all the same thing. So you don't really need the third one. I don't know why the textbook put it in there. But uh, basically, you can have a second form on that, but they're completely identical. So if I were to show you what the formula is from the textbook, it's one half sine A plus B minus sine A minus B. Now, how are they linked and why am I saying they're the exact same one? Remember, sine is odd. So you can move the negative inside, make that a plus sine. Now, if you're going to make the inside negative, you would switch B minus A. Compared to the first one, there's a minus sign in both of them, and uh, B's first, A's second. But that's because in here, A was first, B is second. Now, if you switch it to a sine and a cos, you switch the sine and cosine, B is first, A is second. They're the same formula, 100%. So I don't know why the textbook considers them two separate formulas when they're mathematically the same formula. And I think that's uh, something else that's going to end up happening. Actually, no, that's only here. So I don't know why they gave that one. That one's unimportant. You only need the first three. So example six, this is the only example in the entire textbook where we go over these types of problems. And it's a fairly simple one. It's asking us to write six sine of 40 times sine of 15 as the sum or the difference of two functions. So what we're doing is we're taking a product they're multiplying. So you have sine times sine. That's a product. Change it to a sum. Hence, we are using a sum to product formula. So 6 times sine of 40 degrees times sine of 15 degrees. Let's ignore the 6 for now and only look at the sine of 40 and sine of 15. So the 6 is just going to be along for the ride. We just drop it down, basically. So we copy down the 6, and we're really just paying attention to the sine 40 and sine 15. The one that we want to apply is the second one, sine A, sine B, because there's two sines. So then I use the one with the two sines in it. So if I use the middle formula, it's times 1 half bracket cosine of A minus B. So what's A, what's B? Let's let A equal to 40 and B equal to 15. So really that's 40 minus 15. Then there's a minus sign if I continue using the formula. Cosine of A plus B, 40 plus 15. And this is equal to, now I can go ahead and incorporate the six. Six times one half is three. 
in parentheses or in brackets cosine of what's 15 subtracted from 40 is that 25 minus cosine of 55 because that's 50, uh, 40 plus 15 and I think that's what they mean when they say that they want it as the sum or the difference of two functions now I don't see two functions I see so if you wanted to change this that way it looks like two functions distribute the three three cosine 25 degrees minus three cosine 55 degrees so you can see it as the difference of two functions that one minus that one and that's all they want here which is why I don't really spend too much time on these formulas in a pre-calculus class because uh, when we're looking at a pre-calculus class the there's, they're quite limited how we see them it's really just a direct application of the formulas so that's example six so as you imagine in calculus this is just one small little step be, uh, in a larger part of a problem or as a part of a larger problem and it's something you're going to be able to do quickly or are expected to be able to do quickly sum the product backwards what if i have the sum of two sinusoids and i don't want them to be written as a sum so you can go backwards to a product and there's a way to use these formulas and to go backwards and it's kind of ugly trying to do that the first time i ever tried proving those it took me a long time to figure it out but it is kind of fun if you try it on your own so then let's see what are the formulas so the first one sine of a plus sine of b sine of a plus sine of b this one is 2 sine of a plus b divided by 2 that's the entire angle so whatever a is whatever b is you add them then you divide the result by 2 that's going to get multiplied by cosine of the half of the difference a minus b over 2 so we went from adding two things to multiplying two things that's why it's called a sum to a product so it went from a sum to a product sine a minus sine b has a slightly different formula this one is 2 cosine a plus b over 2 times sine of a minus b over 2 and this one is the same thing as this formula with just a small little manipulation the negative sign can be thought of as a negative sign on b instead and a plus sign in between so sine of a plus sine of negative b you just replace b with negative b in the first one so you get 2 sine of a minus b over 2 times cosine a plus b over 2 same exact formula except for a minor negative sign so this one is derivable from that one but they're not entirely independent of each other or they're not entirely uh they're not exactly the same formula you just change a little bit about the first one to get the second one if we look at uh, the next one cosine of a plus b those come from the first two here so the first one cosine a cosine b this one's going to be a product of cosines so it's two cosine of a plus b over two times cosine of a minus b over two and then the third one the third one is not derivable from the uh the fourth one's not derivable from the third one like the second was from the first this one you'd have to mess around with the second one up here to figure it out sounds a little harder this one is two sine times sine sine a plus b over two sine a minus b over two which uh even though we're adding on a lot of formulas and we're already several in these amongst themselves are kind of easy to memorize if you know the ones before the product to sum so if you had to memorize these which not really uh, but if you had to memorize these they're not too too bad if you study uh, the sum to product and product to sum together but anyway number seven 
write cosine 3 theta plus cosine 7 theta as a product of functions. So if I number these 1, 2, 3, and 4, which of these am I using? I'm using the third one, cosine a plus cosine b. So this is cosine a, cosine b, and they're being added. So if I use that third one, cosine 3 theta plus cosine 7 theta, this is equal to, according to the formula, the third one that is, 2 cosine of everything that a is, which is 3 theta, plus everything that b is, which is 7 theta, you add them, you divide them by 2. Now you keep on going with the formula, it's times cosine of the subtraction of the same things, 3 theta minus 7 theta divided by 2. So then I got to simplify. This is 2 cosine of 10 theta over 2, which is 5 theta, times cosine of, that's going to be weird, negative 4 theta over 2, which is negative 2 theta. And where am I getting that from? 3 theta minus 7 theta is negative 4 theta. Negative 4 theta has the 2 on the bottom, which the 4 and the 2 reduced to 2, so negative 2 theta. And I can still simplify this a little further, and not much. Cosine 5 theta stays the way it is. Cosine negative 2 theta, well, you could just disregard the negative altogether and say that that's cosine 2 theta. Now, what's the reason for that again? Cosine is even. That's the reason why. And you can leave it that way. It says leave it as a product of two functions. I already have it as the product of two functions. That's good enough. So that's example seven. Six and seven, though. These are the sum to product and product to sum formulas. And really, they're just there because you're going to see them again later on in calculus. They're not really too, too important in pre-calculus, but the, the importance of them has to do with what you're going to see later on. Now, if you're not taking calculus, well, that was kind of a waste of time for you. But either way, half angle identities. These are extremely important. These we're definitely going to see in the homeworks. And uh, you'll notice there are three variations for tangent. And that one has to do with dividing sines and cosines and messing around with, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll see. So how do I find this one? How do I find this one? And then we can figure these, at least one of them out, by dividing these two, the ones I circled. And then uh, maybe we'll see that there's other ways that we can write the first one. So let's concentrate on cosine and sine. So for cosine a over 2, for that, I'm going to look at a previous example. I don't remember what ex example it was exactly. I think it was example 3, where they had us find the cosine of an angle given cosine of 2 times the angle. So going from an angle, or going from double angle to just the regular angle. And no, it wasn't example 3. I think it was example 2 then. Yeah. So example 2. If you look at what's given, they gave us cosine 2 theta is equal to negative 12 over 13. Find cosine. And we found cosine. So going from the double to just the single is what we did. And we applied the formula for cosine 2 theta with the cosine only in it. And we solved for cosine by square rooting a manipulated form of that equation. That's the route we're going to take here. So for example 8. Oh, actually, not at example 8. The formula, cosine a over 2. I'm going to move this over to the side. We want cosine of a over 2. That's the goal. And that's going to come from analyzing cosine 2 theta. Cosine 2 theta is 2 cosine squared theta minus 1. That's a fact. That's one of the double angle variants for cosine. Solve for cosine. Because the reason being, this is twice the angle. This is one half of that. So double angle, single angle. Or if you think of this one as the single, this one's the half of the single. That's the reasoning behind that. So we want to solve for cosine. 
So what you do is you add 1 to both sides, and I get 1 plus cosine 2 theta equals 2 cosine squared theta. Divide by 2. 1 plus cosine 2 theta all divided by 2 equals cosine squared. Square root both sides. And if you square root both sides, you're done. You get plus minus square root 1 minus cosine 2 theta all divided by 2. Now that's not the half angle formula. The half angle formula has an a over 2 in here. So how do I figure this out? Well, you're going to let theta equal to a over 2. And if that's the case, cosine of a over 2, so I'm replacing theta with a over 2, equals plus minus square root 1 plus cosine 2 theta. But theta is a over 2. So 2 times a over 2 is just a. And there we go. So if I want the cosine for an angle, or the half of an angle, you would plug it into this formula with the full value of the angle. And that's the first formula. So this is plus or minus square root 1 plus cosine a over 2. Okay, now that's going to explain what's what goes in here. So in the following identities, the plus or minus symbol indicates this, that the sign is chosen based on the following, or based on the function under consideration, and the sign or the quadrant of the angle A over 2. So basically, you're going to pick which of the two signs based off of the quadrant of A divided by 2 that angle. Not the quadrant of the inner angle, but the quadrant of the angle that you want. So that's the first formula. Second formula, sine of a over 2 is found basically the same way, but you change the formula that, that we're working with. Cosine 2a, or 2 theta, is equal to 2 sine squared theta. Actually, no, that's not right. 1 minus 2 sine squared theta. Solve for sine, and then we basically get the formula for sine a over 2. This is the one I want. So what we do is, we can move some stuff around. I'm going to add 2 sine squared theta because that one's negative and I want it to be positive. I'm going to subtract cosine 2 theta. You're going to end up getting 2 sine squared theta equals 1 minus cosine 2 theta. Divide everything by 2, and then square root sine theta is plus or minus 1 minus cosine 2 theta divided by 2 as a square root over the whole thing. So that is uh, one way that you can write out the double angle identity in terms of sine only. Now, if you want to change that to a half angle identity, you replace theta with angle divided by 2. So sine of a divided by 2. That's equal to plus minus square root. 1 minus cosine 2 theta is the same thing as cosine a over 2. And there is our half angle identity for sine, which is almost identical to the cosine one except for a plus sign or a minus sign in between. And that's the, not the right one to compare it with. This one. So the only difference is a plus or a minus sign. Cosine's a plus, sine's a minus. So this is plus or minus square root of 1 minus cosine a over 2. Okay, so then how do we figure out the tangent ones? To figure out the tangent ones, what you do is you take the cosine and sine ones and you divide them in the order that you need to get tangent. Because tangent is equal to sine over cosine. So let's go back over here. And using those two results, tangent 
of a over 2 is equal to sine of a over 2 over cosine of a over 2. And we just plug them in. Plus minus square root 1 minus cosine a over 2. And then divided by another plus minus square root 1 plus cosine a. And then divided by 2. So here's what I'm working with. And that's nowhere near simplified. So here's the idea. You're taking a value that's either positive or negative and dividing it by a positive or negative. And uh, really, we don't know what quadrant a over 2 is in. So we're not sure. It's just if we knew what the value of a over 2 was, then we can just choose a plus or a minus. So I'm just going to write a 1 plus or a minus on the outside. And the reason being it's because we, we want this to be a general formula. We'll, we'll pick and choose what uh, sign it is, plus or, or minus, depending on what quadrant the value is in. So once they gave us a value to work with, then we choose positive or negative. But they didn't give us a value, this is a general formula, leave it as plus minus. Square roots. If you see a fraction of square root quantities, you can just absorb everything into a single square root. 1 minus cosine a over 2 as a first fraction divided by the second fraction. 1 plus cosine a over 2. The division law of the sandwich again, the 2's cancel. And you're left with plus minus square root, 1 minus cosine a, 1 plus cosine a. And that's your first form for tangent of a over 2. So I'm going to write that over here. Tangent of a over 2 plus minus square root, 1 minus on top, 1 plus on the bottom. Now, if you knew the formulas for sine and cosine, it's just the inner values dividing each other. How do I know which one's on top? Sine's on top, cosine's on the bottom. So minus on top, plus on the bottom. Easy mnemonic if we had to memorize those. Where are the other two coming from? So that's going to be weird. How do I figure out what the other two are? So let's work with one of them, the only one that I have so far. Tangent of A over 2 is plus minus square root, 1 minus cosine a, 1 plus cosine a in the bottom. So I'll just flat out tell you where they come from. You notice that these are different uh, only by a sign in between, 1 minus, 1 plus. They're conjugates of each other. And conjugates in a fraction, uh, usually if you're trying to prove an identity, uh, what the problem is begging you to do basically is to multiply one of them into both top and bottom. So you can have a perfect square on one and then a difference of squares on the other. So let's try doing that with the one on top. I want a difference of squares, let's say on the bottom. So I'll multiply by one minus cosine a and then one minus cosine a again. I'm going to do that inside of the square root though. And on top, you have a perfect square. You should remember the perfect square formula. It's going to end up being 1 minus 2 cosine a plus cosine squared a. Actually, no, I don't even need to do that. That's too much work. Square root 1 minus cosine a times itself is squared. I like that because I have a square root. Maybe I can get rid of the square and the square root together. They'll cancel out. The one on the bottom, 1 minus cosine a, 1 plus cosine a is 1 minus cosine squared a. Before I start canceling out square roots and stuff like that, look at the bottom. That can still be manipulated a little bit more. Pythagorean identity, 1 minus cosine squared a is sine squared a. Now I have two squares inside of a square root. So this simplifies to plus minus 1 minus cosine a with no square over sine a no square. That's the second form. So I'll write that down over here, wherever it was at. Here it is. It was um, 1 minus cosine a over sine a with no square root. However, you still have a plus minus on the outside, though. So you need the plus minus on all of these because we're not sure uh, in the general case what quadrant a over 2 is in. Unless you're working with an exact one, like in example 8, where they give you 22.5, well, that one's obviously in the first quadrant. So you would need positive for all of those. 
but uh, in the general case, leave it as a plus minus. What's the third form? The third form comes from the strategy that we apply. And instead of multiplying by cosine or one minus cosine a top and bottom, multiply one plus cosine a top and bottom, the results get flipped. And what ends up happening in the end, which I won't show you, try this on your own if you want, see if you can figure it out. You get plus minus sine a on top over one plus cosine a on the bottom. Try to verify that on your own. I'm not going to show that, but uh, you should be able to figure it out. And if you do, that's good. So those are the three forms for tangent a over two. One of them has a square root with the variation of the sine, one minus on top, one plus on the bottom. No square root, one minus is on top, sine is on the bottom. No square root for the third, sine a on top, one plus cosine on the bottom, no square root at all. So those are ugly identities in the form. So if you had to memorize all of them, this is adding five more to the list that we've already had, which I'm not even gonna to try to count how many we have so far, but this will be the end of that list. These are the last five out of, I think it was 53 if you try counting them all. Go through all your notes actually, count all of them, and um, that's how many formulas you would have had to memorize, and I would have tested you on that, but because of the current situation, I'm not. So if you wanna like make yourself a little happy, just go through, count all the identities, and those, those are how many identities you're not gonna have to memorize for a grade. So example eight. Find the exact value of sine of 22.5, so I'm gonna go ahead and write it out, 22.5 degrees, using the half angle identity for cosine. So they're telling you how to do it. Use the half angle identity for cosine. So they're talking about, wait, that's kind of weird. Use the half angle identity for cosine. I think what they mean is the half angle identity which happens to have a cosine in it. So that's what they mean. So they're saying sine of a over two. This is supposed to be sine of a over two equals to plus minus square root one minus cosine a over two. Okay, so then how do we figure this one out? I need to figure out what A is first off. What is A? A is the number that when I divide it by two, I get 22.5. So A when divided by two is equal to 22.5. So then A is equal to 22.5 times two. 22.5 times two is 45 degrees. So what that means is, I'm going to write this out on the side, sine of 22.5 is the same thing as sine of 45 degrees divided by 2. So then I can plug it in. This is equal to plus minus square root 1 minus cosine of A. Just A by itself without the division by 2, in this case 45. Now I was just going to write 45. That would be wrong. Cosine of 45 degrees. All that divided by 2, square root. Then we can figure this out. Oops, accidentally zoomed out. So I got to figure this out. And uh, in order for us to figure that out, I need to know what cosine of 45 is. Cosine 45 degrees, which you should already know, square root of 2 over 2. That's just extra work that I'm doing on the side. This is equal to plus minus square root. 1 minus that, square root of 2 over 2, all divided by 2. And really, at this point, that's the trig. At this point, it's algebraic simplification, which might be confusing for some of us, but if we're pros at fractions, this should be no problem. So square root, and what do I do here? You can probably distribute the 2 on the bottom. So here's the idea. Instead of dividing 1 minus square root of 2 over 2 by 2, you could divide by the, or multiply by the reciprocal. So it's 1 minus square root of 2 over 2, and that's going to be multiplied by 1 half. So division by 2 is the same thing as multiplication by 1 half, and that's going to get distributed into both. 
or basically that would have just been distributed on both here, dividing by 2. So this is going to equal to plus or minus square root 1 half, and then minus square root of 2 over 4, which we're not done, because those are two fractional quantities, and I'd like to combine them into one fractional quantity. The way to do that, get these to be a common denominator. I want this one to be a 4, because that one's a 4. And 2 is, di uh, is a factor of 4. 4 is divisible by 2. So we'll just make it a 4. So that's going to end up being square root plus minus square root 2 over 4 minus square root of 2 over 4. And at this point, we're good to combine the top 2 minus square root of 2 over 4. And this is it for this particular problem. So that's example eight, and that's just a direct application of the formula. Now, the formula is kind of weird to work with because it's a square root and a square root with a fraction within a fraction in this case. But that's what you're going to be seeing for problems like these. Example nine, which before I do example nine, I'm going to look ahead just to see how many problems we have left. If I understand correctly, it's 12, but I'm not sure if we're doing all 12. Ten we're doing. That's a hard one. 11 is just a easy application of the formulas. Those don't look easy, but they'll be easy. And then there's a verification problem, which I'm probably skipping that. So we'll stop at 11. The major one is 10. So if I stop at 10, that's basically all we need. So it's 9 and 10. So we'll look at number 9. Find the exact value of tangent 75 using the identity that tangent a over 2 is equal to sine of a over 1 plus cosine of a. Tangent 75 degrees. And this is supposed to be equal to tangent of A over 2, which is equal to sine of A over 1 plus cosine of A. Notice how they didn't put a plus minus in the front. So where'd the plus minus go? So that comes from this angle, 75 degrees. 75 degrees is in the first quadrant, so I know for sure, for sure, tangent is positive. So we don't even need the plus minus on that because it's definitely positive. Okay, so what is 75 the half uh, of? So what number, when I cut it into 2, gives me 75? That is 150. This is the same thing as tangent of 150 divided by 2. So that's because 75 is equal to 150 over 2. That's the reason why. So then I'm working with 150 in the formula. That's sine of 150, because we just want a, not a over 2. a is 150 over 1 plus cosine a. So then i got to figure out, oh, and a is 150. Then i got to figure out what sine of 150 and cosine of 150 are. And for that, I'm going to go to another unit circle. 150 is here. That is 150 degrees away this way. That's 30 degrees this way from the x-axis. So then I'm going to compare it to 30 degrees. If that's 30 degrees, the coordinates of those point or that point is square root of 3 over 2. Uh, so square root of 3 over 2 comma 1 half. So 150 being 30 degrees on this side is negative square root of 3 over 2, positive 1 half. Because it's quadrant 2, x is negative, y is positive. And it's the same values as the one in the first quadrant. So then we can figure this out, no problem. This is equal to sine of 150. Sine of 150 is the y coordinate, 1 half, divided by 1 plus cosine of 150, which is the x coordinate negative square root of 3 over 2. So we got to simplify. And what I could probably do is, well, first off, I need to combine these two. So 1 half divided by, and this is going to be 2 over 2 minus square root of 3 over 2. So that's 2 minus square root of 3, and then divided by 2. And of course, we've seen this over and over and over again. The 2's cancel. You're left with 1 over 2 minus square root of 3. 
and this is not in a form that we can keep. I need to rationalize this. So how do I rationalize? We have a two minus square root of three. You multiply by the conjugate. So it's going to be one over two minus square root of three times two plus square root of three over two plus square root of three. On top it's two plus square root of three because it's times one. So that's nice. On the bottom it's four minus three because this is a minus b, a plus b. And when you multiply those two, you get a squared minus b squared. So a squared being two squared is four. B squared is square root of three squared, which is three. So that on the bottom just equals to one and you just get two plus square root of three. And that's it for example nine. So we'll look at example 10. Example 10, given cosine of s, which I don't like how they're using s, but either way, cosine of s is negative three over seven. s is between pi and three, pi over two, so that's quadrant three. Find s over two, sine of s over two, cosine of s over two, tangent s over two. It's three different things, so I'm gonna go ahead and separate these as a, b, and c. So let's just concentrate on a, sine of s over two. And that shouldn't be too, too hard because it's just a direct application of the formulas. So let's see, sine of s over two, which I don't like s, can we change that to theta? Hopefully you'd be okay with that. Anywhere I see an s, it's a theta. So sine of theta divided by two. The formula is plus or minus Square root, it's a plus or a minus, and I forget which one. So I think uh, it's a minus for sine. And yeah, and I have it boxed. Sine of a over two is the one minus cosine of a inside of a square root divided by two. So that's gonna be one minus cosine theta over two. So they told me what cosine theta is, and it's negative three over seven. So plus minus square root, one and that's going to be minus negative three over seven and then divided by two which the minus minus becomes a plus so plus minus one plus three over seven over two underneath the square root then i got to do some algebraic simplifications because that's the application of the trig formula the rest is just algebra so one plus three sevenths one is seven over seven plus three is ten 10 sevenths over two inside of a square root plus or minus. To divide that by two, you can multiply both sides by two and you get 20, actually, you can divide both top and bottom by two. And dividing both top and bottom by two will give you five over seven square root plus or minus. And that's as far as we can go inside the square root. I can't simplify that, five and seven are both prime numbers. The only thing I could do now is decide if it's positive or negative. We're in quadrant three. Oh, and that's cosine theta over two or sine theta over two. That was kind of a tough one. So if we're in quadrant three, I have to do a little bit of, um, a little bit of math to figure this one out. If we're taking an angle that's in quadrant three, We're talking about all of this region, quadrant three. This is pi, and this is three pi over two. And I'm taking those angles and I'm dividing them by two, or whatever angle that is, it's gonna get divided by two. So see if you can follow me here. If I take this angle and divide it by two, you get this angle, pi over two. If I take this angle, and I divide it by two, I get three pi over four, which is over here. So what that means is, 
these angles between pi and 3 pi over 2, all of those when divided by 2 are stuck inside this region. So what that means is this was theta. Theta over 2 lives in this red region. And that red region is all of quadrant, it's one half of quadrant 2. So using that geometrical argument, I'm saying theta over 2 is in quadrant 2. So theta over 2 must be in quadrant 2 based off of that argument. So the lowest number it could be, theta that is, is pi. And the highest number it could be is 3 pi over 2. So the lowest number you take it divided by 2, the highest number you divide that by 2, and you're stuck between pi over 2 and 3 pi over 4, which all of those angles are in quadrant 2, except of course for pi over 2. But um, that's just a boundary. So it's the shaded region is in quadrant 2. So because we're in quadrant 2 and we're asking for sine, we disregard the negative. It's positive. So this is the answer for sine theta divided by 2. Cosine. So for letter B, cosine theta divided by 2. There's a couple of things you could do. You can use the formula, which as you can see, the formula is kind of ugly. Or we can use a Pythagorean identity since I know what quadrant theta over 2 is in. Either way, doesn't matter. No, I'm not going to use a Pythagorean identity. I'll just use the formula. I'll deal with it. Plus minus square root 1 plus cosine theta divided by 2. And uh, we're in quadrant 2, so I'm going to ignore the positive. In quadrant 2, cosine is negative. Equals to negative 1 or negative square root of 1 plus cosine of theta. Cosine theta was given negative 3 over 7. And then divide that by 2. So we're taking 7 minus 3, and that's 4 over 7 on top. Divide that by 2, and we want the square root and the negative of that square root. So we move that. It's a little too scrunched up. So then we're multiplying 4 over 7 by 1 half, and you get negative square root of 2 over 7. And that's it for cosine. Oops. Then we want tangent, which there's a formula for tangent. I'm not even bothered with the formulas for tangent because we have both sine and cosine. And if we have both sine and cosine, we just divide them. So letter C, tangent theta over 2, you just divide sine and cosine in the order that we have it. Square root, 5 over 7 divided by negative square root, 2 over 7. So the answer is going to be negative because of that negative, and this one's positive up on the top. So it, the result's going to be negative, so I'll write that on the outside. I'm going to absorb all of this into one big square root, 5 over 7, divided by 2 over 7. And, of course, these 7s cancel. You're left with negative 5 over 2. And that's it for tangent. Which there are a few more examples. But I'm going to go ahead and stop it here. This is the important stuff for 7-4, and this will be it for my dual students for the first half of chapter 7, which is what we're going to be tested over. So this is what you're responsible for knowing up to this point for the first test. For my pre-APs, this is what you're responsible for knowing up to uh, 7.4 for the next homework assignment, because you'll have a homework assignment for 7-4 and 7-3. My dual students already had that homework assignment, and that'll be it. So for the pre-AP students, expect the homework for 7.3 through 7.4 all together, one big worksheet. Uh, and what I'll do is I'll go ahead and put up these videos as links uh, with the homework assignment. For my dual students, you are to expect a review for 7.1 through 7.4, and I'll put all of these videos linked into there for, the, for that assignment. So that'll be it for the first half of Chapter 7, so that's one major unit down. We'll stop here.